All right. Welcome to Restructuring Options in Cannabis Out of Court Workouts. Uh, I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to, to filter in here, and then I'll, uh, I'll let people introduce themselves, and then, uh, then we can get rolling. Uh, you know, the intro part is, is the least meaty part of this presentation. So, you know, if you, if you come in late, don't, I'm not too worried about people missing the, missing the intros. We'll just give a, a minute here until people come in. Um, if you're joining now, you know, we'll have Q&A at the end. So to so type in any questions and, um, you know, I'll cherry pick the easy questions for the end. All right. Well, we might as well might as well do the intros here while uh, <clears throat> while people are filtering in. So uh, I'll, I'll just go down in order. Let everyone say a bit about themselves. Phil Silverman, based in Massachusetts, one of my partners. Uh, multi decade uh, experience in bankruptcy. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah, that's. Uh, I I was uh, prior to getting into the cannabis industry, I was a bankruptcy attorney here in Massachusetts for about thirty years, doing. Chapter 11s, Chapter 7s, representing debtors, creditors, uh, bankruptcy trustees. Also did quite a bit of work in uh, out-of-court workouts for, you know, really all size companies. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm more recent to cannabis the last six or seven years, but I did did have that background prior to that. All right. So we'll, we'll introduce our non-Vicente uh, person yet. So Christopher Stefan, who's... I think you've got the longest tenure here of anyone in cannabis, which is a, a point of pride these days. I you're think on, you you're muted, on. Christopher. Uh, he's still standing. Back when, when I started in cannabis, they didn't have Zoom and webinars and panels like that. So. And soup was soup was a nickel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but um, yes, my company uh, is Desarrollo Real Estate, but. I really am active under our Cannabis Capital Advisors Division. Uh, we provide brokerage and valuation services to cannabis businesses, licenses, and real estate, and we help raise debt equity. Uh, and I have worked on a few uh, receivership sales and I'm working on um, some currently right now that hopefully we can talk about a little bit today. And I was going to say, from, from my perspective, and why it's great we got Christopher on this line is, is he's really, really dialed into the Colorado market. Um, and, and can provide sort of a level of advice to clients, you know, in the industry trends and operational side that, uh, it, you know, it's it, it's very useful because this is not, you know, there, there are some funky, there's a lot of funkiness in this industry as, as, as we'll cover. And you got to know that. So uh, next we'll go Elliot Choi, Chief Knowledge Officer of Vicente. Hey, everybody. I'm Elliot Choi, as, as Charlie mentioned, I'm currently the, the Chief Knowledge Officer here. Um, I've been doing corporate transactional work um, out of New York for the past 13 years. Um, I also spent some time in-house as the USGC of TerraSend and uh, helped them complete their, their gauge cannabis acquisition. Um, but also I'm here focused on the New York market, trying to get the New York licensing regime off the ground here and, and get the regulations all, all nice and friendly for everybody. And finally, uh, our own in-house cannabis economist, Andrew Livingston, I, I think he's probably spent more time looking at cannabis markets than than anyone else uh, alive at this point. Not that there's anyone I think dead who's looked more at it more, but uh, <laughs> he's he's also I killed that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a, listen, cannabis market analysis a ruthless game. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he's been he's been in the cannabis industry for a long time, and he, he's gonna be talking to us about sort of financial modeling and market dynamics. I'll let him talk. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, um, my name is Andrew Livingston. I'm the Director of Economics and Research at the law firm. Uh, it's a fancy title for what I really do, which is help clients navigate state markets across the country and some markets internationally, <laughs> and really help them look at the unique landscapes from a business opportunity, how to take advantage of those in ways that are profitable, uh, at which states and times to avoid uh, how to enter in markets uh, and how to ensure that uh, you've got some positive cash flow from that. Um, I've been doing this for a little over a decade. Um, uh, started uh, helping to pass Amendment 64 back in 2012. So, Christopher, I think you're a little a little longer than me, but probably not that much. You okay, were, you were in high school. Yeah, <laughs> you were in short short pants. Okay, so let's uh, go to the next slide. I, I'll, I'll skip the slides. Hawking my book. Um, and we'll go straight into the the state of the industry. Um, so this is a <clears throat> you know 
just yeah, steal yourselves here. Um, and you know, I, I don't want to be too negative. We'll go to the, go to the next slide. Cause someone did send a link around that they expect, uh, you know, legal cannabis sales to increase 14% this year. Um, in the US and and that's because of this second bullet point which is that yeah. you've got a bunch of new adult use markets so the the existing markets are shrinking on a year over year basis but it I don't think the numbers look as bad and curious and by the way everyone hop in you know if you got something to say here yep. uh, I don't think the numbers like the year over year numbers look bad but you keep in mind we're coming off of sort of the sugar high of covid yeah. uh where people were staying at home and smoking a lot of weed and getting government checks and which is which is great for the cannabis business but you know once that kind of died off people going back to the office you know the the covid money dried up uh you know it's you see a crash so i mean if you look at the numbers versus like a 2019 it doesn't look as grim as looking at it versus sort of the covid highs yeah. Yeah, and Charlie, I'm happy to happy to jump in here. So, you know, the other thing that we have to look forward to um, is expansion from markets that we helped to pass in 2021 and 22 um, in this new year, right? So, you know, 2020, um, obviously presidential year, we passed a number of um, new programs. Many of those started out in 2021. Uh, so we saw, you know, the Arizona market uh, continued expansion in uh, Illinois um, and and Michigan. Um, you know, and those were all great. You know, 2022 we didn't see that much new expansion, particularly because states like you know New Jersey, New York, uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island got off to a slower start. Those will continue to expand in 2020. Uh, three, but we also added uh, a few markets that will will drive growth because they're they're kind of quicker transition. So Missouri um, in, in that we passed in 2022 at the Fa ballot. Fastest, fastest state to a billion dollars in sales, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have to check with Arizona, double check with that, okay. but both of those are similar in a number of different ways based upon how they transition. You know, obviously New York's going to be slower, um, you know, but we'll, we'll see, um, you know, New Mexico will grow, not a giant state. Uh, and Virginia is, you know, still being determined how and and when it may or may not pass this legislative session when it comes to the implementation of the adult use program that passed a few years ago. Um, so as Charlie mentioned, you know, it's a little bit of a pandemic boom and bust. Um, you know, there was a massive change in how consumers spent uh, from experiential to consumer product goods. And thankfully, during the pandemic, cannabis was an, a consumer packaged good that uh, was deemed essential and helped to augment a otherwise um, uh, less fun existence of staying at home and watching Tiger King. You know, you could get high. And so that was a good way to do it. Um, and obviously that, you know, slipped. So what I would recommend people to do when you're looking at total trends um, is look at, let's say, like Colorado and just imagine that the trend that happened that ended in 2019 continued into 2023. And it's going to look a lot more linear than the up and then down that happened from that pandemic. Um, furthermore, and I'll talk about this in, in a bit, cultivation growth and seasonal harvests. Uh, there was a lot of increased supply because there was increase in demand that happened based on COVID. And so that increase in supply that suddenly hit in a big way with outdoor harvest in 2022, uh, sorry, 2021, and by the time it came online into 2022, demand had kind of rebalanced itself uh, between experiential and consumer packaged goods. And that increase in supply and a drop in demand resulted in price crashes in some of these markets, which really is what tanked uh, the, the total volume of sales, not necessarily the, the total, sorry, the total value of sales, not necessarily the total volume of sales, but the value of those sales declined. Um, furthermore, we've got real struggling, uh, you know, push between, um, you know, falling prices and increases in inflation, uh, both with labor as well as with kind of your other operational costs. And, you know, without bridge loans in the same sort of way, without access to institutional capital, this has left a lot of uh, businesses, you know, trying to find those still friends and family investors uh, and, and angel investors, and, and many of them are unwilling to invest in in cannabis given what we've seen over the last couple of years and in the markets generally next slide please yeah and i would just add so i think when you're looking at um the the state by state numbers you know i, I agree with andrew is like you, you got to look at it versus 2019 not just 
2021, 2022. But I think that, you know, to me, like the COVID declines, you know, that's, that's, you know, God willing, it's a one-time occurrence. Um, but if you see declines because of neighboring states legalizing, like that's not going to be a one-time thing. That's, that's, yeah. that's a reality. So, you know, I guess the question is with, with year over year declines in a place like Colorado, right? Look, looking at the chart here, you know, how much of that is coming down from the sugar high of COVID? How much of that is, you know, Oklahoma, um, let's say, yeah. um, or, yeah. New, or New Mexico. Um, th that to me is more, uh, just a long-term play. And then just to talk about the money. So the issue I'm seeing from the corporate perspective, and Chris, we're curious if you're here differently as this is like, everyone was raising based on the assumption that the financing trends would continue, which is that like sort of your, you know, your, your good teams, your splashy brands, we're going to have, we're going to be able to raise at decent valuations. Um, people raised a lot of money. They spent the money quickly, sort of assuming they could do the B round, let's say. Um, and then, the, you know, then the financing trends change drastically, right? And, and now you're caught where you've got to raise, but you can't raise. And, and that's where you end up in a, an unfortunate situation like we're, we're talking about today. Yeah, I, I think that is, that is characteristic of the market is you have strong companies with strong asset bases that had capital plans um, of, of continuing to raise to fund growth, CapEx, and expansion into new markets. And as that um, financing has dried up, they're kind of looking around, well, well now what do we do? And, and, and we, I think we'll talk about some more of the challenges they'll face based on you know, the, the, the broader economy, the uh, Fed's use of interest rates, as well as um, state caps limiting the buyer pool um, or the merger pool, if you will, uh, for, for large scale companies uh, in limited license states to, uh, you know, seek uh, liquidity events, to seek exit strategies and, and just to seek continued, uh, continued operations. Yeah. And so what we have here is, you know, I've looked at um, since January uh, 2020, so slightly before the pandemic really hit. You see here in Colorado, you know, we had crazy spike in the summer of 2020, when many of us were at home. Um, and, you know, then a decline really since uh, since the fall of 2020 into the current period. Uh, but we're ending at a similar point that we were at when we started in 2020. Um, you know, will this decline continue? Um, that really depends upon how, where uh, wholesale and retail prices go in Colorado. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. And Massachusetts, obviously, you know, a newer market, uh, not a new market, but a newer uh, relative to Colorado, uh, you know, saw significant growth, particularly after it shut down uh, dispensary, shut down adult use stores um, briefly during the height of the pandemic. So, you know, significant growth uh, through the fall of 2021, and then has been leveling off for a bit, uh, which I think in large uh, part is due to those prices uh, that I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, please, next slide, Pia. Right. And, and so here what we have it on the Colorado side is the adult use average monthly plant count. And here you can see the clear seasonal dynamics of outdoor harvests. Um, and then really, you know, if you look at the trough between uh, the valley between the two mountains and, and the direction of that valley, you can see what is happening during the non-peak uh, summer, uh, summer harvest months. Uh, summer into fall harvest months um, and whether or not that's up or down. So, you know, clearly between the um, the harvest in 2021 and 2022, you can see the direction of that. You know, there is some market correction and declining in the number of cannabis plants. And while we don't have the data past September of 2022, it's likely that that uh, peak is going to be closer to what it was in 2020 than it was in 2021. Um, you know, in front of it, you can see the average market price for flour. You know, we hit a peak of that um, at um, almost $1,800 a pound in early 2021. And that has been stagnant or declining um, through the current period. What I will say is that this is the first period um, since, you know, kind of mid-2021 that it is stopped declining. So it is you know, this period and then the period before both at $658 per pound, um, you know, for, for marijuana flower, which is the lowest it has ever been, but it seems to be slowing for a little bit. So the market is correcting in Colorado, just the speed at which it will correct is hard to know. 
Massachusetts, uh, you know, we again see, you know, prices were at almost $400 a, an ounce retail um, for a long time. They, they hovered in that way, um, you know, since really the market started. Then we saw the big, uh, the first big outdoor harvest in the summer of 2021 and prices started to decline. And they've been on a downward trajectory since that harvest came out, uh, since we look at supply and demand shocks. Um, and, and really that was kind of what needed to, to tip the market. There was, you know, uh, always kind of an equal stasis of supply and demand until, you know, we suddenly had a lot more supply and, you know, people had to drop prices uh, in order to try to reach those store shelves and then compete uh, for consumers. Now, you know, this is a benefit for consumers with lower prices. And, you know, in Massachusetts, we're seeing sales stagnate, sales value stagnate, which likely means that sales volume is increasing, but the sales volume is increasing at a similar rate that the sales value uh, is decreasing. Um, Andrew. Uh, you know, per item. What I'm hearing anecdotally, and, and you know, we're, we're seeing it in some numbers, but not broad enough to, you know, to to to, to speak in, in these kind of trends. But in Colorado, we are seeing the same. We are selling the same amount of product, the same weight of product out of the stores, but we're seeing, you know, revenues down anywhere from twenty to even fifty percent. You know, and so it's it's really, you know, due to price, due to demand. Um, but it is the same amount going out the door. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's good for good for the consumer, but but not great for the operators. Yeah, and, and, and that's a it's a great point, Christopher. You know, prices in Colorado were likely at the point at which, you know, our price elasticity of demand um was kind of flat, right? So increases in uh, sorry, decreases in price aren't necessarily increasing demand. Right in the, in the natural way that that occurs. Now in Massachusetts, where prices were much higher, a decrease in price probably is increasing volume of demand because you know they were still at that point where some people weren't purchasing as much as they would like to, or were not purchasing all of their cannabis from legal and regulated market because prices were still high. And I know this personally because my brother told me, and you know, <laughs> I've got a lot of anecdotal evidence from my my friends in in Boston who consume quite a bit of cannabis that they're like, oh, suddenly I'm going to buy it from the stores because we're not talking about you know fifty dollar ace, we're talking about twenty dollar ace. Interesting. So just, you know, and I've, I've seen some numbers, they, they say that California may have bottomed out in terms of pricing and it's trending up. I mean, it's, it's, it's also an interesting question, right? If you look at this stuff versus, I guess you could, we could develop, maybe we'll have another webinar on economics of the illicit market versus the licit market, right? I mean, I'd be curious to see if you, if you put the, the street price on this, you know, what point it crosses. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting book. Can can legal weed win? That I think touches on that that competition. But I'm gonna let's just move on here and get into the yeah. meat of the legal discussion. Uh, if we could go to, okay, so yeah. we're just gonna skip this. But suffice to say, you know, we've got some headwinds, um, which is you know prompting this this webinar. So we'll go to the next one. Charlie, okay. you want me to handle the next couple? Uh, sure, sure. I, I think we'll just we'll just speed through the you know the federal law piece because we covered this on the last receivership one. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, just as a general proposition, uh, bankruptcy has not been available to cannabis companies, you know, plain and simple, uh, because this is a controlled substance, and uh, the bankruptcy courts don't want bankruptcy trustees uh, handling uh, the the proceeds of uh, illegal sales. Uh, and they view it as a bad faith use of the bankruptcy system. Next slide. Um, and again, this is just sort of the Controlled Substances Act, which everybody's probably somewhat familiar with, uh, you know, when they got into the industry. So I'm not going to go too far into that. Next slide, please. Uh, so these are just sort of a, a listing of cases. And it, what it's really about here is, as I said, Basically, bankruptcy hasn't been available, certainly to a plant touching company, but also to some of the ancillary companies. Uh, for example, you know, landlords of uh, bankruptcy businesses have not been able to file uh, for bankruptcy either. Um, so, uh, you know, the question is, is how how far does that go? How far uh, removed from the plant uh, do you have to be before you can file for bankruptcy? Next, next slide, please. And uh, that's why this, this Hacienda case is, is sort of interesting. This was 
uh, a, a, an entity that was, I think, a you know ba basically a passive shareholder, and they uh, were actually allowed to be in bankruptcy, weren't dismissed out of bankruptcy, um, and so you know uh, there there was as you can see it says the mere presence of marijuana near a bankruptcy case doesn't automatically prohibit the debtor from being involved in a bankruptcy. So yeah, that's I, important. I yeah, my takeaway from the Hasi, I think I don't think people should get too ahead of themselves. I think it's a pretty unique case. And I think the US trustee is also appealing the yep. the refusal for the, the the motion to dismiss. So I, I'm not too hopeful this translates into anything close to an operational company. So I wouldn't I, you know, again, like I think the the message for cannabis companies is that the federal government is not coming to help you at any point. Um so don't count on Bankruptcy reform, don't count on the Safe Banking Act, don't count on anything. Uh, just assume, you know, you've got to fend for yourselves. Agreed. Next slide. So, you know, the, the interesting thing about this is, you know, as, as somebody that dealt with a lot of insolvent companies over the years, bankruptcy was not necessarily so beneficial because of the ability to go into bankruptcy as much as the ability to threaten that you were going to go into bankruptcy. And that was a good way to get an out of court workout. Um, and so the fact that, you know, it's not available to you doesn't mean that your options, that you're out of options, because in fact, you you still have quite a bit of leverage, especially when you take a look at sort of what's going on in the market these days uh, to work with your creditors. Right now in Massachusetts, you know, inventory uh, is uh, obviously at a, at a very low value. Licenses are probably worth significantly less than they were at one time. So in, in terms of creditors that are coming after you, uh, they actually need you because, you know, forcing you out of business and liquidating your assets isn't likely to get them paid. So they're better off in many cases trying to work with you so that they can keep you as a going concern. Uh, and, and you know, that, that, that's an advantage to you, actually. And, and receivership, you know, is still available. And, and th that type of leverage is, is, in fact, available in a receivership. Next slide. Um, again, uh, you know, it's receivership is sort of the next best step to bankruptcy because it does involve some protection uh, of yeah, a court. I'm just, I right, Phil, if you, if you, excuse me, I'm, we're just going to breeze Please, that. We, we got a separate presentation on receivership. You can watch it on YouTube. You uh, bet. It's fantastic. Yep. Um, so let's get it. Let's get into the meat of this. Sorry guys. I, 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 a lot of lead up here, but just, you know, so everyone understands like, why, why are we talking about this? What's going on? So we go to the next one. Um, all right. So, you know, what, what is an out of court workout, right? Out of court work is it's simply a negotiated resolution with creditors and other stakeholders to distress situations without involving the courts. So there's no, I mean, there's no real magic to what a workout is or an out of court workout. I mean, it's just, it's a contractual solution to a, uh, a business problem. And, you know, these, these, I put down some sort of common situations. I mean, the big one that we're dealing with right now is restructuring loan agreements, right? So someone falls behind on their debt or they breach a financial covenant on a loan. You know, <clears throat> what does the lender do? And Phil just raised this point, which is at the end of the day, the leverage of the bar is that the lender doesn't want to write off the loan. Um, and if, if you have to foreclose on the assets and sell them on in today's market, you, you may be writing off a substantial portion of the loan. Nobody wants to lose their investment. So, you know, the, the hope is that everyone's sort of rational and comes to the table. Uh, you know, and they get into other common situations, debt for equity swaps, you know, which, which you've seen, um, you know, we've seen this with public companies, right? So like this would be, and, and again, this is more in the bankruptcy world because you've got the CCAA up in Canada with Ianthus and Gotham Green, where the debt holders essentially become the new common stockholders. The existing common stockholders get sort of crammed down uh, and that allows the company to continue. Down equity rounds, not always a, not always truly like a out of court workout situation, but you, you can see these situations where, you know, at, at the end of the day, a lot of these, a lot of companies in cannabis are not cash flow positive. They need the cash to survive. So why should an investor put good, more money in, right? A lot of times the answer is because you're going to give them a fantastic deal because uh, the value of the company has gone down. So that, you know, down equity round. Crown downs of these exit holders. We talked about that. And then the big one, the other one is like negotiations with landlords, right? Uh, as as you go back to Andrew's slide, right? If you're selling for 1,200 pound versus 500 pound, um, 
you can afford one lease under one economic model and another lease under the other economic model. The landlord's not necessarily going to be able to turn around and, and relet a built out cannabis grow facility. Um, so they hopefully they're incentivized uh, to work together. Uh, but yeah, the, these are the ones that we're seeing right now. I don't know. Did I miss anything, guys? All right, we'll go to, go to the next slide. Yeah, these are just kind of like the players in, in an out of court workout. There's obviously, you know, the lawyers. Um, but you know, the 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 this Christopher Stephens of the world, the brokers of the banker, because oftentimes you're gonna be looking for more financing or you might be selling off per certain assets. Mm -hmm. And of course, worst case scenario, you're selling the whole thing. Uh tax advisors and you know, and uh, and accountants. Uh, we're not going to get into sort of the tax nuances here because we don't have any tax professionals on the call, but you, you, you got to be careful uh, when it comes to tax here. Um, you know, anytime you're you're playing around with issuing stock at lower valuations or you're doing a, a debt for equity swap, you want to avoid creating a taxable event. So you got to be careful there. And then of course, CROs, sometimes companies will bring in someone specifically to sort of turn things around. Um, next slide. And these are, um, common issues. So that, that we're seeing, you know, these, these, are, you know, trade creditors, you're behind on your trade credit. They're, they're following up. Those can be difficult to negotiate with because it's smaller. They're not necessarily, you have no real ability to drag them all together. Um, but again, you know, people rather get something rather than nothing, unsustainable lease obligations, people being behind on their leases, service providers stopping work, uh, corporate governance challenges, which we'll talk about, you know, the fiduciary duty aspect of this can be tough when you're wearing multiple hats, perhaps your lender and your officer of the company, you, you can be exposed there. Uh, the early investors being upset, you know, because the investment's not doing well. Um, it cannot, you know, you talked about debt for equity swaps that that can be a challenge sometimes based on corporate governance. Um, you know, do you have to let all the shareholders participate in a new equity round? Is that going to delay things? Uh, we talked about debt obligations, the regulatory approval. If you're swapping in a new owner can be quite lengthy here. Um, obviously you got to convince the investors to put in more capital if that's necessary, which is, you know, that's a tough sell. Uh, if things haven't worked the first time around, um, always good if you've got a new plan. Uh, and that's that's why we've got Andrew on, on the call, because I think people are going to want to look hard at those numbers and think about, well, you know, does your business plan work at $500 a pound? Uh, and then, yeah, contractual abilities to drag people. You know, sometimes you've got an ability where one main lender has a contractual ability to force all the other lenders to take whatever terms they negotiate. But that may not be the case. You may have disparate lenders. Um, just, just like practice note here, this is why I, I really like anytime I'm representing a borrower, making sure that we have the ability or the lender, the majority of the debt has the ability to force any amendments on the rest of the lenders with certain carve outs, because it allows you to negotiate with one person. Anytime you're negotiating with multiple people, it, things get tough. And you'll see like, when we talk about war stories here, um, you know, anytime you're negotiating with multiple parties, it, it, it's really tough. And, and same thing with the equity holders, right? It, you may be in a situation where, you know, one equity group can hold up the deal if they don't approve it. Uh, and, and that can be pretty, you know, that's a big issue that uh, we see all the time. A anyone, th anything I missed, guys? No, I don't think so. All right, I'll turn, turn it over to Andrew to business plan. So uh, just again, the, the context for this is you're trying to raise additional capital to turn the business around, right? The first question from any investor is going to be, well, I gave you all this money up front. Things haven't gone the right way. Why should I trust you again, right? So partially the business plan, partially obviously a team issue, but uh, Andrew, take it away. Thanks, Charlie. Yeah. So, you know, obviously one of the hardest things to do is, you know, if you're looking to keep uh, managerial control over the business is to prove to an investor that you can turn things around and that the market 
uh, you know, the underlying environment provides you with the ability to make that company profitable. So, you know, first and most important, uh, you know, when you're looking at this, it's to evaluate your current debt, evaluate what the, the future debt and equity may be, um, you know, and really possibly restructure that past debt with the lenders, maybe have your, your new investors buy out that debt and allow that for restructuring. Um, then when it comes to margins, right? This really is where the business plan part of things gets detailed. You know, you need to look at, okay, what are the current margins in the, in the market? How are those prices trending, right? If they're going down, then in order to, to have show increased margins, you need to be operating even more efficiently going forward than you were in the past. And if you haven't been operating efficiently in the past, that may mean bringing in, you know, new operators, um, you know, new talent, uh, you know, potentially changing uh, what aspects of the business are and are not profitable, cutting pieces of business that are not profitable. Um, you know, and you need to, you know, also if if you're getting hit on the real estate side of things, you know, speak with your land, um, your landlords, you know, whether or not you can restructure a deal with them uh, based upon those leases. Uh, it may be that, you know, one of your stores is really is really great on a sales perspective, but the lease is just so expensive that you can't be profitable there. And it's honestly best to, to sell that, get out if you can. Um, and then, you know, uh, focus on, you know, places where your margins are better, right? It's not always about, you know, getting the most revenue. Uh, it's about getting those margins and, and finding a path to. Um, and this is where it gets complicated because you're going to need to convince a lot of different parties, both your previous investors, your future investors, your operational team, that it's worthwhile, worthwhile to stay on the ship, right? You know, during downturns is times when some of your best talent um, may decide to jump off. And, and this is a problem when that sort of talent is necessary to ensure that your margins um, stay, you know, fat, right? Uh, particularly if they aren't as fat as they need to be. Um, so that as well can, you know, require some intense negotiation with your high level employees uh, providing future incentives for them if they stay on during this period of struggle. Um, and, you know, and, and this really, getting people on the same page needs to be the first, um, the first step in this process, right? Because, you know, if your, your old investors and your new investors and your operational team, you know, can't come to an agreement and you're going to be facing a mutiny, then it may not even be possible to keep your business afloat um, because these businesses are just run by the people that are within them. And particularly if the underlying asset values are declining because of external business operations, you know, sorry, external uh, market uh, environment, then your business operations need to be what, what keeps you afloat. And if that's not going to be the case, that it may be better to cut your losses early um, if you just can't get that business plan and, and everyone on the same page. Slack. Cool. All right. So Elliot, you want to, you want to take, take away for, for do share dues and, and, and Christopher, like if you want to jump in here, I mean, it's pretty legal, but um, just in terms of like what you've seen in terms of, you know, with these businesses, as Andrew pointed out, like people are wearing multiple hats, like we're, you know, there's a deal I'm thinking of where the operators, the landlord and the, yeah, the it's the op the, the landlord has essentially stepped in to operate the company because the old operators disappeared. So now you're in a situation where you're the president of a company, you're you're also the landlord and you've got major lenders. Um so, you know, what are your fiduciary duties? I mean, if if you're an executive role of the company, you've got fiduciary duties to the company. Um and people are going to use those duties to um you know, to apply negotiation pressure to you. Yeah. So just taking a step back for the, for the kind of non-lawyers and, and maybe bringing some of the lawyers back to law school. So, you know, as fiduciary duties, we're generally speaking about the duty of care and duty of loyalty, which typically means you have to do act in the best interest of the corporation shareholders now. So that's just, you know, as Charlie mentioned, one group of the many actors that are involved in the company. And, and, you know, the, the real trick here is, and, and this applies to a lot of businesses, cannabis is that, 
particular individuals wear multiple hats for the same company. They can be the director, majority shareholder, probably also a lender and, and an officer. So, um, you know, the first key here is to make sure that you're making it clear to the parties you're interacting with, kind of what role, um, what hat you're wearing when you're interacting with them. And, you know, if you're in that wearing that director hat, then you have to be acting on the best interests of your shareholders, even if that may impact your status, you know, as a lender and or uh, an officer of the company. Um, so that that's something you need to keep in mind. Now, the, the, the tricky thing here is, you know, we're talking about kind of out of all court workouts, um, you know, approaching insolvency is that um, your fiduciary duties can change if your company is insolvent. Um, you know, whether your company is insolvent, we'll leave that question to the CPAs of the world. Um, but, you know, for instance, in Delaware, there's case law that if your company is actually insolvent, then then your, your fiduciary duties are owed in, in addition to the shareholders, also to the creditors of the corporation. Um, so that means you have to act on the best interests of both those parties. Now, what it doesn't mean, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to you know, dissolve, liquidate, sell all the assets just to pay off the creditors as best you can. Um, you know, as to the prior point, um, you can, as a director, exercise your business judgment, the good old BJR rule, um, and decide that, you know, you think that you can actually turn the company around and make it profitable um, and, and run it that way and try to repay the creditors and, and get money to your shareholders. Um, so um, that's something you can do um, just because you go fiduciary duties to creditors doesn't mean they can force you to liquidate um, and dissolve. Now, uh, it depends on the state you're in, whether or not if, you're in, if your company's insolvent, whether or not you actually have fiduciary duties to your creditors. Um, for example, Colorado codifies in its corporate statute that you actually do not owe any fiduciary duties to your creditors, whether the corporation is solvent or insolvent. Um, so that's something you need to make sure that you understand with your, with your attorneys, um, you know, based on the state of your domicile and your operations, you know, which fiduciary duties are owed to who. Um, there are other things to keep in mind here, too. Um, you know, as you, you know, as a company kind of gets more distressed, um, you know, certain things may or may not. Um, get paid on time, but um, you need to be aware that some of those items could lead to, to personal liability um, for you as a director and or an officer, I mean, including things like missing payroll, um, you know, not paying your certain taxes, um, letting certain insurance policies expire and lapse, um, especially those that are required by state to operate, um, that those could lead to personal liability for the directors and officers. So, this is, those are things to keep in mind, um, especially as cash becomes more tight. Um, the next slide here. Um, so yeah, so as we mentioned, there's a, a bunch of different you know parties involved in, in an out of court workout. Um, you have your operators, as we mentioned. Um, you know we need a team to to stay and run the business. Now, you know sometimes it may make sense to change those operators given given what happened historically. Um, but obviously, you need people familiar with the business, its current operations, books and records to to stay on board to at least make that transition period. So um, negotiating with those people um, can be tricky. Um, you know especially them being aware of you know the state of the company um, and that it's you know on the down and, and they may be looking to leave so you might have to provide some incentives for them to to stay on board and, and try to turn the ship around uh, next slide so the lenders now this is a a big thing and this is what we always kind of advise our our lender clients um you know, at the outright, um, you know, most lenders don't expect to declare events of default, don't expect to exercise a lot of the remedies in, in their loan agreements, especially the secured debt. Um, but, you know, in cannabis, for better, for worse, without, you know, the, the bankruptcy of the courts, um, it's entirely possible that a lender could eventually become the owner of a cannabis license. Um, now, that's something a lender really needs to make sure that they understand and, and are, are, are comfortable with. Um, because, you know, as we know, many lenders in the industry also lend to a lot of operators in a lot of different states. Um, so some of the issues they really need to be uh, aware of are the license caps. Um, so, you know, you could become a you know, if you have a lender to too many operators in one state and you want to take ownership of all those licenses, um, you may not be able to. So you may have to, to pick and choose which ones um, you want to actually take ownership of. Um, you know, lenders also need to be aware of the, the background check requirements that come into play. Um, and these could apply to spouses too. And we've had many uh, clients have unhappy spouses uh, be, that had to undergo background checks asking why. Um, so again, this is something that lenders should understand, you know, before they become lenders to uh, things and be comfortable with to actually go through this process if needed. Um, another and I just, just part jump here. In. Yeah, just jump in on yeah. this one. Like two, two quick things. One is on the fiduciary point, be aware, you know, usually the lawyers will represent the company, right? So just understand that like, if you're the executive of one of these companies, you know, your lawyers are not actually your lawyers. 
Um, so if they give you bad legal advice, you're probably out of luck. Um, so just, just be aware that, you know, that the lawyer's job is to look out for their client, which is probably the company and not you individually. Uh, but in these insolvency situations, you, you got to look out for yourself because well, we, we're probably going to run out of time here, but yeah, you, you, you could have personal liability in some of these situations. The second though, the lender is like obviously stretching out the loan, figuring out the details. It's, it's usually the best case scenario because it doesn't require you taking an ownership position. The other thing to keep in mind is asset deals are not always possible depending on where, where you're located. Uh, you know, some states it's easy, some states it's hard, some states it's impossible. But you know, if you if you want to go in there and pick out the choice assets and and leave the rest of the liabilities behind, that that may not be possible from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, Charlie, I, I, I jump in here too because I do think that this will be a trend. This 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 issue and dynamic that we're seeing here. Uh, there are major senior secured lenders that have been lending to MSOs, both private and public around the country, you have your sale lease back uh, reads both private and public. You know, the questions are, do these uh, lenders uh, security provide them a clear path to title? Each situation, like you said, is going to be subjective. Um, but do they want it? You know, a, you know, a famous story of Trammell Crow in the savings and loan crisis. This is a real estate developer out of Texas, one of the largest, you know, in the country. And, you know, he lined up all his lenders for a big meeting and they're all ready to, to get a piece of, of Trammell's butt. And, and he comes into the to the meeting and they got a big uh, conference table and there's 10 or 20 lenders sitting around the table. And he brings in a big cardboard box filled with keys and he throws it on the table and he slides the keys on the table and said, there you go, guys. Here's your here's your collateral back. And all the lenders said, no, 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 we, we don't want our collateral. You know, we're here. We, we're here to go. Nego we'll negotiate. We'll negotiate. You know, they came in there ready to you know, to, to take the knives on it, but, but really do these lenders, do they want them back? Do they have the ability to take them back? Um, does this lead to receiver situations? Does this lead to merger opportunities? It's definitely going to be a, um, an area of creative destruction in the market that is, is going to drive the market for acquisitions, dispositions, and sadly business failures. Yeah. And sorry, I'm just going to keep pushing this thing forward. I know I've been talking too much, but just, so we get time for, for questions. Uh, next slide. Elliot, in 30 seconds, any thoughts on equity holders? Well, equity holders, you just got to keep them, you know, obviously they're your big stakeholders initially. Just make sure that they're on board with whatever is going going, going around, with the, especially with the lenders. Um, you know, keep them informed. Um, and then obviously make sure you check your agreements to make sure that you're getting the consents needed, especially if you have multiple classes of shares. Um, you, might need, you might need majority consent from all of them. Um, so just make sure you're keeping that in mind and, and keeping the, the, the players you need to and updated so that, you know, they're happy and, you know, that they know what's going on. All right, next slide. And by the way, everyone's going to, we're, we're going to send around the recording of this and we're going to send around the slides because, you know, we always get too ambitious with these slides. Uh, yeah, landlords, you, you, I think the landlord piece is just from a cannabis regulatory perspective. Like sometimes you can get the landlord's ownership easily. Sometimes you can't. Uh, and ownership, you know, obviously you're trying to compensate someone for for reduction rent. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll take an upside on the company, but you know, that's not always the case, but you know, um, the, the big thing here is like, you know, again, like we talked the, like the key story, right. Uh, it's not as if the landlord can turn around and relet the facility to another grow operation, let's say easily. Uh, next slide. All right. We'll just, we'll just go real quick here so we can leave ourselves some time for questions. Yeah. So it's just the cannabis regulatory piece. Any, anytime you're changing control here, you need regulatory approval. It's very much a state-by-state -state issue. It can take a long time in some states. It could be a real hassle in some states. It could be easier in other states. Sometimes you even have to worry about the local approvals. Uh, and asset versus equity deals are, are, can be very different under certain systems. Some states, like a Pennsylvania, won't let you do asset deals at all. Um, uh, some states like, you know, Massachusetts, you can do an asset deal, but now you're going to need local approval in a lot of cases to do the asset deal. So it's it's like a very nuanced question, which I know is not what anyone wants to to hear. Um, yeah. And the other thing, and Andrew pointed this out when we were putting slides together, like if you, you got to keep your eye on the ball here, because if you own the business and you slack off on compliance and you get uh, you know, there's an issue that pops up that can go on your record, right? And now you're going to have to disclose that every time you apply for a license in the future, uh, which is not going to be helpful in a competitive process. 
Hey, Charlie, the only thing I would add here is, is the timing aspect. So as Charlie mentioned, the approvals could take could take some time, and that's something that needs to be um, considered when developing the business plan, et cetera, where there could be, you know, a couple of months before, say, the lender can actually take control of the day-to-day -day operations. You know, where in other industries, you can, say, do that from day one, um, you know, but here you're going to have to wait for the actual regulatory approvals before you can actually go in and control the business. Yeah, usually, you know, you sign like a foreclosure agreement or what it would have you restructuring agreement, and then you go to the regulators and then you close once you get regulatory approval. And in the interim, you know, you can kind of advise, but you can't be on site running the thing day to day. You know, the, the last thing I would say is that you know, if you're looking at your headcount and your employees to try to uh, determine which are essential and which are not when it comes to um, increasing margins and reducing SGNA overhead. You do have to realize that you know cutting some of your compliance and regulatory team is potentially a serious risk as you know people may be slacking during a period of downturn. Um, and remember that this is a state license that can be revoked at any time for non-compliance. And and the unfortunate reality is is I, I don't think state regulators and apologies to any state regulators on the on the line. Like I I don't get the sense that they're that aware of or concerned about uh, the financial distress of the licensees. So I, I would not expect much in the way of leniency with respect to compliance issues. We, we just closed one last Friday that was similar to this, definitely receivership under a settlement agreement order with the state, uh, but due to the violations of the licensee who, who lost the licenses and, and you know, kind of created the mess, it took more than a year to get it closed with the state, despite having ready, willing, and able buyer. Yeah, no, these these receiverships don't move fast either. I mean, if you look at Airmont, that took a while to close. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we got our contact information at the end. So let's, let's take some questions. If we don't have any good questions, I'll just uh, make up some... Uh, controversial topics here all right um charlie there was a question i i kind of answered it on yeah. whether um whether they could uh in massachusetts if a company never got off the ground and never sold can cannabis could they file then um i kind of answered more from the should perspective but defer to the attorneys on could i i can try to weigh in on that i've I've wondered about that. I mean, I, I think there's a decent argument if you have no marijuana plants, uh, you know, you might be able to. I think the question is, for example, if it was a, a multi-state operator and the way you were going to fund a bankruptcy, for example, was by using money from some other jurisdiction, uh, there might be some question there. But but this hasn't been answered yet uh, in Massachusetts or, quite frankly, anywhere that I know of. You know, what happens if you're in that pre uh cannabis plant so, touching phase yeah yeah i mean like talking to uh tax advisors here i mean you know tax advisors will tell you that you know if you have actually haven't you may not be sold to 280e right if you haven't actually sold cannabis because you're, you're not actually trafficking because you actually haven't engaged in the trafficking act i mean my question on this bankruptcy is what's the what what would be like the dissolution process are you trying to get operational to sell stuff right it, it, would the bankruptcy involve violating federal law or is it just, you know, you're going to sell some equipment. Um, it's not like you're never going to actually obtain the license. I think if you're never going to obtain a license as part of the bankruptcy process, you'd have a much better chance of getting through under kind of the Hacienda thinking. Yep. What if funding came from around CF crowdfunding revenue share like main best? Okay. Great question. Um, you know, which we can answer kind of specifically. Uh, and then, you know, I would say the general question is like, what if you've got 500 shareholders, right? H how do you negotiate with like a, a large amount of people? I'll, I guess I'll, I'll start with my point, which is look, look, at, the, look at the deal documents because a lot of times these venture investment documents will have a concept whereby the, the the principal amount, the majority of the principal amount raised has the ability to amend the documents for the entire round. So so I, I would hope that that's in there. If it's not in there, you can you, you go a different route. But if you have an ability to sort of drag the group along, uh, then you've just got to identify the big players 
Hopefully they're larger investors. If there aren't, you know, you just go with the bigger group and you start with them and then you build a majority. Uh, and I would also say like, you know, people need to be, I think it's helpful to provide, you know, yeah, obviously you want to listen to people, but I think you also want to give them like direction, right? You'd be like, listen, I think you come to them and you say like, this is our plan. This is our plan to turn things around, right? Here's our new business plan. Here's our business team to accomplish it. This is what we're asking from you, right? Your consent to do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, Charles, I kind of view it as a, kind of the opposite of obtaining financing, where you kind of find your lead investor, agree to terms with them, and then and then shop that around to other investors, where here is you, you kind of find your, your your big shareholders, get them on board, and then let the other shareholders know that this is what uh, other people have agreed to. I would just keep in mind that you want to probably be communicative with, uh, with your, your, all of your shareholders to the extent you can, because, um, you know, obviously there could be people necessarily undermining you just because they have a different view of where the company should go. And, and you want to make sure that those kind of side conversations are, are not happening outside your visibility. Anyone with, with, with other thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, yeah, go back to my point. It's like, look, look at the deal docs as a starting point and see what kind of leverage you might have. Uh, I would also say that it may depend, you know, if, if you just did a, uh, a CF raise versus if you did sort of like a dual kind of CF reg D offering, you may, you may, the answer may differ. You know, a good one. I think we, we should all be following. I think it was just announced yesterday or last week. Uh, that'd be the sky Mints receivership in Michigan. It's a very large, you know, probably, I'd have to, you know, do the store count, but potentially the largest um, operator footprint-wise store count in Michigan, um, you know, did a raise in, in the last two years or so, and and I guess the, you know, I, I don't, I don't really have the detailed nuance or color on the specifics of the situation, uh, but it looks like, you know, the, the the market challenges in Michigan, I would assume, you know, have caused the investors and debtors to not um, be repaid on time but but that that'll definitely be a big one uh, to watch and, and one of the bigger ones I've seen seen up all right let's see here as a lender oh there's a good question as a lender are there certain structural enhancements we should include on the front end to protect our collateral position through this process so i think the answer to that is absolutely um you know what what i typically see in loans in cannabis is you know the everything but the kitchen sink approach right so you 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 take every potential every potential protection you can get right um the big thing that you can't really get around is you can't take control of the company without regulatory approval. So one thing to think about at the onset is you could have yourself added as a control, like if it's just a one state deal, it's easy, right? You could have yourself added as a controlling party before anything starts. Now, obviously that is going to put you through the regulated process. It's a huge hassle, but now you're an owner of the business. So if things go south, you're in a much better position to just step in to a you know step in and run things. Yeah, so I'll just to, to jump in here. So you know, obviously, you should have your typical you know collateral perfecting documents. You see one financing statements, your pledge, you pledge agreements, and the like. Um, but you know, also you know, you could definitely go a bit further. Make sure you got power of attorneys. Um, you know, you can even have. Um, an assignment of the permit that can come into effect if there's a default. Um, now, now, as we kind of been saying here, the regulators aren't necessarily going to give you ownership of the of the cannabis license immediately, but at least all that will obviously give you the the authority to go to them and show them that you should be owning the license. Um, you know, you can even we've even had depending on the state and if there's actually a change of ownership application available, you couldn't even have the permit holder pre-sign that um, just in case you know they go AWOL on you and you can already kind of have their signature and can just fill in the rest um there's you know a lot of unique ways to approach this in cannabis um 
but you know, generally speaking, though, um, you know, at the time you actually exercise you know, your remedies, it's going to be a negotiation with the regulatory body. Um, you know, for better or for worse, a lot of the regulations don't really contemplate lenders stepping in as owners. Um, you know, we do expect to see that in some of the, of, you know, as regulations improve and, and are, are modified, and as some of the newer states come online and, and see this gap elsewhere, um, you know, we'll, we'll see some of this. But you know, for the time being, you know. Kinchin Sikin, as, as Charlie said, and, and, you know, you might even think outside the box, like, like I said, the, uh, the pre-signed chain of ownership application. Um, another sort of very sort of um, another interesting question. Um, so how do social equity licensees, you know, further complicate changes of control? Um, I, I would say like, it's a pretty major complication because the, the regulators aren't going to allow you to change the you know, in most cases that the, typically the 51% holder, the social equity licensee. Um, so, and this is, you know, it's a pr pretty big topic. Um, you know, it, it, it creates issues with financing uh, because everyone knows you can't get the change of control approved. So they, they know they have to sit in sort of a junior position indefinitely or not indefinitely, but um, for the foreseeable future. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I guess the only thing I could add is that, you know, potentially in some states, they'll allow you to change ownership of a social equity license so long as you have new owners that also qualify as social equity. Right. So in that case, it could be that the lender goes out and finds another individual that, that meets the qualifications and then could, you know, entrust with that visual individual the kind of majority ownership of, of, the, of the license holding entity. Um, so that's one potential avenue there, but it, it definitely does complicate things. Um, there are some social equity licenses that are fully transferable, you know, without real limitations after X years of operation. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but obviously, you know, depending on how well the business is run, you know, it could be that they become distressed prior to, to hitting those kind of uh, transferability windows. Yeah, and, and this is probably a question or, or, or important focus for, for any of these social equity licenses or delivery licenses, uh, smaller kind of micro licenses, is, you know, is there a market value to this license? Could this license easily be replicated? Could someone else come in and apply for the same license? You know, the a, a social, I, I don't know specifically, but, but, you know, just given my expertise, I don't think that a delivery, the social equity delivery license in Massachusetts is probably very valuable to sell to a third party. Um, you know, so if you were going to try to undertake bankruptcy to try to get something that, like this back, it might be better to just go find another social equity applicant and partner with them and apply for a new one if there were no moratoriums on those licenses. It's, um, you know, it's what is the value of this license? Like, what is the value of of delivery in uh, in Massachusetts? And delivery is a, a high cost, you know, to, to buy trucks, to, to set up the infrastructure, to employ people uh, in a low margin business. So you, you need to look at it and say, you know, is the, is the juice worth the squeeze? Uh, and given, you know, the the amount of legal and accounting costs, again, I think you probably just start a new business uh, much more easily. Cool. Well, I think we're, we're out of time now. I mean, please do to reach out to any of us. Um, you know, let us know in the comments what you found helpful, what what you would suggest we, we do differently next time. Um, and we do, we do have good recommendations and referrals for receivers. Uh, in multiple states, you know, definitely yeah. reach out to me yeah, for it's Colorado. Very much, and, yeah, it's very much a, a, yeah, state by state um, kind of question. Uh, I don't, I don't know if uh, Massachusetts has like in Massachusetts, there's a list of receivers that have been pre-approved, which doesn't mean they're good. It just means that the regulators <laughs> have, have blessed them already. Which you know, you could do it last minute in Massachusetts too. It's um, and if you're if you're undergoing, um, you know, a, a a tight time and you know you need to analyze the the market environment that you're in whether or not you're a uh, a lender looking to to lend to a distressed company or, or you're a distressed company trying to prove to lenders that you're you're worth investing in uh please do reach out uh, as as we analyze cannabis markets and cannabis business opportunities across the country and uh always you know looking to help you whether or not you're in a a, a positive situation or or one that's a little bit uh more worrisome and I'll I'll just throw in uh, if you are a company that is experiencing some kind of financial difficulty, in my experience, what tended to happen was that you know a lot of people just stick their head in the sand and hope it goes away. Not a good idea, you know. Better to to approach it 
uh, up front, uh, because a lot of times when you do that, you forego a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, there's all sorts of decisions to be made, who to pay, who not to pay. Uh, and if you let it go too far, you run out of those types of decisions and you really don't have a way out. So I, I would be proactive. All right. Well, thanks everyone so much for your time. Good day. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you.